I'm Paul McDade, an editor, and on very rare occasions, an actor working in the TV and film industry in Los Angeles. And with me is my sister. I'm Liz McDade, a huge Columbo fan and a small business owner living in Santa Cruz, California. And this is Trenchcoat Cigar Peugeot, Wandering with Columbo. In each episode, we'll bring you a little Hollywood history, glamour, and behind the scenes as we walk you through Columbo, one of America's greatest TV detective series. Yay! Yay! And today, we are talking about Season 2, Episode 6, A Stitch in Crime. This aired February 11th. 1973. So you weren't born yet. I was not even born yet. <laughs> but you were born. Yep. I mean, yeah. I've been I was two years old. Two well, years old. One and, and almost two. <laughs> almost two. Almost two. Watching Columbo. <laughs> yeah. In uh, Boone, North Carolina. That's right. Mom and dad would just prop you up in front of Columbo. Sean was in his drawer. He slept in that drawer. Oh, that's right. That's right. Our older brother. So what a champagne well, you got, huh? Okay, so tonight our drink is champagne, and I am having a brute. Uh, so it's a, I don't know if this is technically a champagne. By Fabergé? It's, no. <laughs> it's Vuve du Vernet. I'm definitely see it? ruining that. Let's see it. Nice. Yeah, here we go. Oh, that looks really nice. I'm showing Paul on the camera here. Yeah, it's cold. It's got bubbles. It's yellow. What can I say? <laughs> what about you, Paul? What's your champagne? Mm, this one is um, like a five dollar ah. domain Laurier. Nice. You know, that's like two mini. A little mini. Yeah, I'm not a big champagne person. I think a long time ago, I yeah, 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 like in college or something, I thought it was amazing. <laughs> but now I'm just like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> What about you? You still like it a lot? I mean, I don't drink it often, but yeah, it's nice. I like the bubbles. Okay, and our snack tonight is smoked salmon on toast with caviar and sour cream. And I put a little dill as well. Paul, you want to tell us, walk us through your snack? Oh, yeah. You sent me a picture of something uh, pretty amazing yeah. looking. St. John, my wife, she did some magic. Um she got me a crab leg. <laughs> so it's awesome. creme fraiche, which is, you know, fancy sour cream. I didn't know that, but it is. Mm -hmm. Chip and dip uh, seasoning from Penzi's. Oh, wow. Yeah, I had to write all this down. Scottish smoked salmon and butter lettuce and some bread. It's gluten-free. It's from the UK. It's from Scotland, Edinburgh. What's the name of the company? It's called Genius Joyful Artesian Loaf. Ooh. And it's, I, get, I don't know if it's frozen when she buys it, but we put it in the freezer and then I cut it and toast it. And it's pretty good. I mean, bread just, I've never had bread <laughs> be like how it <laughs> yeah. really tastes, unfortunately. Right, right. But that's, that's what, that's how, it, where I'm at now. So, and St. John said this is a deconstructed uh, crudite. Okay. Uh, so it's not, you know, mainly because of the gluten issue. Yes. Uh, so yeah. And then I have the, some, some eggs and some th tomatoes um, and some cayenne on the creme fraiche. We'll hold it up for the camera oh, so uh, oh. we can see. In case here. we uh, show these, or we can, we'll, we'll eventually show these at some yeah, point. Yeah, eventually we'll get these videos somewhere. Okay. Oh my goodness, uh, Paul, so. that's amazing. So Paul's plate looks a lot like what Columbo has. We'll get to that scene. And then my smoked salmon. Okay, I'm super excited about this. I'm going to bend my oh, camera yeah. down. It's this is totally vegan. I oh, wow. made um, smoked salmon, which was carrots, thinly sliced carrots, marinated. Actually, they were boiled then marinated. And I even made caviar, Paul. Wow. Yeah, it was it's like a real. little mini science <laughs> experiment with the kids. Soy sauce, water, and agar agar. What's agar? And then it Seaweed? it's like a thickener. It's like an all natural oh. thickener. Yeah, but then you cook it and then you squeeze it. Do this, you know, do a little process, and you get these little pearls that look like caviar, and they taste like fish eggs are kind of like salty, yeah. fishy. And, and then we also bought some vegan caviar that um, is, uh, they call it seaweed pearls. So they're very similar. They're probably made with agar agar, 
and some pulverized um, seaweed. Are those the bigger ones? Yeah, so the bigger ones are the ones that I made. Oh. Now, all this is going to be on our Instagram, and then the smaller black ones are the ones that we purchased. Wow. And I got to tell you, it's good. This was our dinner tonight, oh, and wow. everybody loved it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have one bite. No, don't. <laughs> how did you mm-hmm. make the? So how did you make them pearlize, or how did you make them get them small? So after you thicken the soy sauce in the water, then you put it into a squeeze bottle. We used a turkey baster because we didn't have a squeeze bottle. And then you drops of the mixture into cold vegetable oil, and that helps them form up into drops into balls. Oh wow! And then you strain them out of the cold vegetable oil. You put them in warm water for a little bit, and that helps get the vegetable oil off and probably also helps them firm up a little bit more. But they're pretty cool, I got to say. Yeah. Yeah, caviar, I mean, the price is way up there, so. Yeah, it's crazy. I've only had it like once or twice. Once in college, I had a, a old girlfriend who really liked it, and she's the one who introduced me to it, and it was really good. Yeah. It's going to come up in this episode, and caviar is also going to come up in a later episode that we have not gotten to yet. So that'll be fun. All right, well, let's move on to the next segment, which is our Smoke Signals, uh, where we read letters from our listeners. Yeah. Okay, so yes, Smoke Signals is the the name of the segment where we read, as you said, letters from listeners. And I think someone gave us the title. We mentioned it before, Michael, yeah. And I read a thing by an author, Ward Beers, and they, their thing was on fire and smoke, ethnographic and archaeological evidence for line of sight signaling in North America. And I just thought it was, I just wanted to find out how much truth in smoke signals. And, and apparently it was very real thing that different people would signal each other if there was a war party coming or how many people were in the party, all kinds of things. So it was a very real thing. And this piece actually focuses on I want to say the Pueblo people of New Mexico and in, in, in middle New Mexico, which is uh, not too far from where, you know, our mom's side of the family, some of them were from. Uh, so the first letter that we got that we're going to read is a correction. Thank you so much from Tizo. They had had a correction for us regarding re- Requiem for a Falling Star. And in that we said that uh, the Sportsman's Lodge had been closed, but in fact it's very much open and it was extensively renovated in 2019. The meeting and convention space was torn down, and that was replaced with shops and restaurants. But the hotel is still there, along with the wooded landscapes and pond. So thank you so much for uh, that correction. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, we don't want to hurt anybody's business or give false information. And I I should have clarified that when I was describing, because I think what I was thinking of was the kind of where they film this, that part is gone, but yeah, there's very much still a business there. That's the hotel. Like, like Tizzo said, Mm -hmm. well, the wooded landscapes and pond, that would be part of it though. Right. Yep. Yeah. And that I did not realize was still there. So that's awesome. And then from Laura, this is also regarding Requiem for a falling star. They said, she said, I have a lingering question for you. Can we be sure that Nora intended to kill Jean? When I first watched this episode years ago, I came away believing that Nora intended to kill Jerry and had accidentally murdered Jean, not anticipating that Jean might borrow Jerry's car. When Columbo states later in the episode that Jean's death was a terrible mistake, I thought he was referring to Nora's error. It was only in repeated watches that it occurred to me she might have killed Jean on purpose, but did she? The ambiguity only makes me love the episode even more. So what do you think, Liz? Yeah, I think that's a good question because I also, when I first watched it, I thought, no way she did that on purpose. But then I think the main giveaway for me was that she took the air out of Jean's tire. Yep, exactly. So she was definitely trying to get Jean into Jerry's car. So that made me think, you know. But, you know, there's still that ambiguity because killing Jerry would have also protected her secret. Right. Because Jerry is the only person who probably would have published his, you know, this secret theory he had about Nora killing her husband. But, yeah, I, I think she meant to kill to, to kill Jean for sure. Yeah, I think letting the, t- the air out of the tire would force her to. Yeah, that's kind of a big thing. Use the other car that was available, which was Mel Ferrer's. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And then we have one more letter from um, Jim regarding Greenhouse Jungle when we discussed that a few episodes back. And one comment that I had in this episode was near the end, Kathy Goodland 
the woman who has been giving Columbo so much grief this whole time kind of warms to him really quickly when Columbo arrests Jarvis, the uncle, and she realizes she's no longer a suspect. And I just felt like, wow, that was kind of weird how she warmed to him. But Jim had an interesting take on this that kind of helps you know, explain or explore why she might do that. He said in that last scene, he Columbo's spelling everything out to Kathy Goodland and to everyone, and he asks her to take a seat. And so in that moment, she's becoming a member of the audience. This is from Jim here. Just as we were watching this performance unfold, and more importantly, she got to see the magic of Columbo cracking the case and exonerating her. So he sees this sudden change, sort of 180 degree change, to mean that she went from a mere character in the show, trapped in her role of the sarcastic, bitter Goodland, to an impressed, awestruck audience member, becoming an immediate fan of the famous lieutenant. And I think she finally saw Columbo for who he was the whole time. So thank you for that, Jim. We really appreciate that thoughtful interpretation of that last scene and Kathy Goodland, how she could have changed so fast. Um, and thank you to everyone who's written us. Uh, sometimes we're a little slow to email back, but you know, we get to you eventually. So <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And we love hearing from you. We love hearing what Columbo means to you or any corrections you have for us, any thoughts you have on the episodes. So email us at trenchcoatcigar at gmail.com. If you have anything you'd like to share. Okay, Paul, let's move on to the summary of this episode. So in this episode, Dr. Mayfield, a heart surgeon, tries to murder his research mentor slash collaborator, Dr. Heidemann, by using the wrong kind of suture during Heidemann's surgery. But Dr. Mayfield's nurse catches on to this plan because she's assisting the surgery, and Dr. Mayfield murders her to keep her silent. Columbo digs into the nurse's life and last day to uncover the full plot. All right, Paul, now we can get into the thick of it here. All right. Let's get going. I'm excited to break this one down, and I have some fun location discoveries to share. Oh, cool. So this starts with an emergency. We hear a siren, and we see a cantankerous patient resisting oxygen in the back of an ambulance. <laughs> Dr. Heidemann, and the ambulance is driving down Melrose Avenue. Mm. And if you pause and watch this first part slowly, there's a number of landmarks that can help you figure out that, oh, this they're going down Melrose Avenue. And the main one I saw was the Nicodell Restaurant. Um, so I went to oldlarestaurants.com to find out a little bit more about Nicodell. You can also see it's right next to a station called KHJ. So back in the late 60s, early 70s, this was at 5511 Melrose Avenue. 5511? Yeah, but it's gone. And now it's a Paramount Paramount Studios. Oh. This stretch of Melrose is pretty different. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. But that was kind of exciting. There's all these kind of cool old businesses. I, I didn't get to check out all of them, but Nicodell was a, a pretty well-known restaurant and I think KHJ might have been a TV station. I'm not totally sure about that. So Paramount wasn't Paramount then? Well, they weren't where they are now. Oh, okay. Yeah, probably. Yeah. A, yeah, I don't know the history. Yeah, there's Lucy's El Adobe Cafe uh, Cafe Restaurant, which I think is really old. It's I think a lot of actors used to go there. That's near there. Oh, okay. Which is on the south side of that street of Melrose. Okay. But I always remember the name Smell Rose. <laughs> Greg Araki, the filmmaker, independent filmmaker and director, he put that for some of his characters, the dialogue <laughs> in the movies. Because <laughs> he, he wrote some a lot of his scripts on Melrose at one time. And he met, I think, James Duvall, uh, actor, was in some of his films on Melrose. But Melrose has the Groundlings, you know, where a lot of the SCTV or uh, Saturday Night Live people that's on there. I've taken classes there. But yeah, there is a really good BLT place right by that that I used to go to. I Actually, I used to pick up food oh, nice. for um, one of those reality shows when I was a PA right over there. Nice. So I always used to go by Paramount. I, I've been into Paramount like uh, once for an audition and then once to deliver something. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> 
That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. And and I, I really appreciate finding historical photos like this website I yeah. mentioned, oldlarestaurants.com, because, you know, cities change and it's it's easy to lose some of that history. So, yeah, that was cool to find that. And so the ambulance pulls up in front of the hospital. This was uh, filmed at um, 333 Universal Hollywood Drive. So the Sheraton Hotel on Universal Studios or right next to it or something. So it's it's actually a hotel, not a hospital. <laughs> and this location gets used in the next Columbo also. And just a little bit of history about this hotel. Telly Savalas lived in this hotel with his family. It doesn't look the same today. So there's still a Sheraton at Universal, but they've definitely remodeled the front. So you probably wouldn't recognize it. I could not find many photos of it online, but that is the address. All right, Paul, it's time to, to check in at the ER, the emergency room here. We see uh, several other patients in the emergency room, and Mr. H- Dr. Heideman gets wheeled in on a gurney real low. Nowadays, you know, we pop those gurneys up high, but he's like a foot above the ground getting wheeled in to the hospital. And uh, Nurse Sharon Martin comes to check on him. Did you recognize the Nurse Martin, Paul? Oh, Anne Francis? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. She's great in this. Yeah. I mean, she was okay in the other one, but this one, she's really good. Yeah, I totally agree. So Anne Francis plays Sharon Martin who, and she also played Valerie Bishop in Short Fuse, um, the girlfriend to the, uh, you know, the main the main bad guy, Roger Roddy Stanford. McDowell. Yeah, Roddy <laughs> McDowell. Yeah, I thought she was Stanford, really, yeah. really great. Yeah, much much better performance, more believable than in than in Short Fuse. Well, I think she had in this one. She she really cares about the doctor who got pulled yeah. in. She really cares about him, and he, and I think that dynamic, perhaps the director gave her that or was in the script. And so she latched on to that and she's, you know, she's the one who really calls him out. Mm -hmm. uh, Leonard Nimoy's character. Yes. All right. Well, Paul, let's go down to the lab. We got some lab work to do. (laughs) Dr. Mayfield sitting in his lab, which is within the hospital. And he's reading a telegraph that's actually addressed to Dr. Heidemann, not Dr. Mayfield. And Heidemann pops in and says he had to come out for a drive. And there is a really cute co-star in this scene, Paul. I don't know if you noticed this cutie in the very beginning here. Uh, no. Ooh. It is a little monkey. Oh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. He's, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah. A pa- I'm pretty sure this is a Panamanian white-faced cappuccin. Um, one of these monkeys is also in Pirates of the Caribbean and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And it's often people recognize this monkey as the kind of the one that will be next to the organ grinder. So this little monkey has a little a little moment in the spotlight that he or she is the patient that the doctors are checking on. And uh, Dr. Mayfield gets to hold little monkey's paw. Well, they're part of the testing, too, though, right? Right. The testing. Yeah, yeah. So they tested their technology, whatever they're developing on this poor little guy. But um, I had to look up this, what is this adorable little monkey? Um, And so I just have a couple of facts about this monkey I have to share. It's native to the forests of Central America. It's super intelligent and they've been trained to assist paraplegic persons. This is all from Wikipedia, by the way. Um, It's a medium-sized monkey weighing up to uh, over eight pounds. It has a tail that can help support it. And the oldest one has been reported to live up to 54 years. There's a lot of animals in this space. None of them get any kind of spotlight. But there's also um, another monkey underneath this one that's brown. It it might be a bonnet, a macaque, macaw. I don't know how to say that. I should have Googled that. Anyhow, so there's a lot of animals in cages. And in this scene, we learn the motive. We learn Dr. Mayfield's motive. He's really eager to publish their findings and be the first, you know, the first on the scene. Dr. Heidemann is not eager. He wants to take time. Make sure it works. Exactly. So, Paul, I'm kind of like not super, I mean, this, I love this episode. I'm just going to say that. But I have a a little bit of disbelief around this kind of a motive. Mm. I feel like murdering someone to publish your research findings earlier feels like a stretch. But I Googled it. I Googled it. I was like, have there been other cases of researchers murdering their collaborators or 
some kind of power struggle. I didn't really find anything, but I did find a couple of interesting things. So there are a lot of cases of graduate students murdering their faculty professors. Which is even less, right? Like the the weight of what they're going to actually achieve from doing that, the return would be less than actually making a lot of money on something that's like a something that you would manufacture for hospitals, which is huge money, right? So yeah, like any kind of medicine or something that'll make things better, quote unquote, it's like a, the, the fugitive, right? That's part of the spoiler alert. Part of the mm. big thing of that is, is that very thing oh we're talking gosh, about. You're right. How did I not think of that connection? Cause I love that movie. So I hear what you're saying, but yes, no, I hear what you're saying, Paul. You, you might have a point there. You might, you might have a point. But the but, grad student murders have been more like they were getting kicked out of the program. And mm. so they they were threatened by like loss of status and career potential and not so much like I want to publish this paper or I want credit. Well, I think yeah, oh, I see. Right. But this is like a something they would they would manufacture, right? Right. So that's that's money, right? That's big money. Yeah. Or well, potentially. Potentially. And if you have someone as esteemed as the uh, the man who comes in for the Will G- Greer plays. Right. You know, he's been there for a long time and he's one of the top dogs. That's true, Paul. Yeah, I didn't think about the money. I don't know why I didn't think about the money part. But as soon as you said that, I was like, huh, maybe, yeah. And then I'm like, well, the money thing. Yes. There was a really interesting, I just have to share this random thing I found when I was Googling. In 2018, there, you know, there's some researchers down in Antarctica they're kind of stationed down there, pretty isolated. In 2018, one of the researchers, another staff member, I think the pretty sure the person was okay. And apparently, one allegedly, one reason was that the man who got stabbed was ruining the ends of all the books that the researcher was reading. <laughs> so there's like a little library of books down there that mm. they you know, can pass the time. <laughs> that sounds really like jerky thing to do but then like like you pushed them too far and they're all isolated oh, they're like isolated this guy this poor man he's like reading a book at the at lunch and the guy's like i'll tell you what happens mm-hmm, like thinking they're funny uh but there might have just been a general conflict and these two people just not liking each other so i don't know yeah what was that was that a newspaper article oh yeah i was i read it online do you remember the publisher? If you Google 2018 Antarctica researcher stabbing, you'll see it. <laughs> Was that some of uh, uh, Elliot's uh, people under your husband? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Are you sure? Did you ask him? Thankfully, no. You should ask him if he's got any tales like that of the, you I'll know, people him. that that are in different countries that he's working with. I'll ask him. Yeah. Anyhow, very interesting. Uh, so, but back to Colombo here. Back to the lab, uh, Doctor. Dr. Mayfield realizes that Heidemann is actually there because he was having severe chest pains and that this is, you know, more uh, evidence that Heidemann needs to have a surgery right away. He's been postponing it surgery and it needs to happen now. So it's going to happen that night. And also in this moment, nurse Sharon Martin realizes that Mayfield was reading Heidemann's telegraphs and that makes her pretty uncomfortable. He, He read it and held on to it. And she shares her concerns with Dr. Heidemann, but he is so casual. He's not worried at all. He's like, oh, that's just his, you know, his personality. So now it's time to go under the knife, Paul. It's time for a serious procedure. Yeah, don't. Yes. We got to get in the operating room. I like the, really like the music in this scene. It gives a good, creepy, spooky feeling. And, um... And there's not a whole lot of dialogue in this scene. Oh, yeah. It's really good. Yeah, but it's really well done. Billy Goldenberg, he's great. He's the music person? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just a quick side note, this set, this operating room set gets used again in an upcoming episode, Lovely But Lethal. But it's not a hospital. It's like a lab testing room in that one. But in this scene, Sharon realizes that something is wrong. You know, her gut about Mayfield was right. And the, there's something wrong with the suture that that Dr. Mayfield used in this procedure. So it's kind of a important, more important information happening here. All right, Paul, let's go check on the monkeys again. Let's see how they're doing. Okay, let's do Sharon, it. Sharon's back in the, in the lab and she confronts Dr. Mayfield about the sutures and says, 
there's something wrong with these sutures. If these aren't right, I know they're not right. And I had to do a little bit of a deep dive. I would call it a shallow dive on sutures just to see like, how is this re- is this real? Are there really two kinds? And there's actually probably several different kinds, but the big categories are absorbable or non-absorbable. So they think they use the word dissolving and permanent. Maybe is it dissolving and permanent? So yeah, those are the actual types, broad categories, and the permanent ones are usually black or blue, where the dissolving or absorbable ones are usually clear or white. And then I was looking back at David Koenig's book, uh, Shooting Columbo, and he actually has shares a story by the writer of this episode, Hendrix. It was inspired by Hendrix's recent uh, shoulder surgery where he had to learn a little bit about sutures or the doctor shared a little bit about sutures with him. And that got him wondering like, Ooh, that could be a cool, you know, plot point. So that was what inspired this storyline. So that, that was kind of cool. For Cheryl, Cheryl Hendricks. I think so. Yeah. 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 He was the writer. Yep. That's the writer. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. I love the script. Yeah. It's really well done. Okay, so let's go out to the garage now. We know that Sharon is on to Dr. Mayfield. She's headed out to the parking garage to head home after her shift. And Dr. Mayfield steps out of the shadows. And this, I thought, was also really well done scene. It's very creepy. He is like super scary in this moment. So he steps out of the shadows. He's just staring at her with like a very like blank face. And he kills her. He rifles through her cool leather purse. I just have to point out. He, he looks straight at her and he's just like waiting That's for her. So yeah. So scary. Her purse has this, it's like leather. I think they call it tooled leather when it has some kind of designs on it. It's got a really big buckle and this thick leather stitching. And if you wanted to get a vintage, similar vintage purse, you could find one on eBay or Etsy. They're pretty pricey. They're about, the ones I saw were like hundreds of dollars to get like an actual purse like that today. Oh, wow. Yeah. How much were they then? Do you know? I don't know. I, the description of them online is like a hippie, quote unquote, hippie purse. So I wonder if they were maybe a little more affordable. Mm-hmm. But uh, today they are pretty, pretty limited. So, yeah. Well, I, I kind of like how they cut this scene here. So the murder happens and then we're still there in the garage in the morning and all the police. Now it's full of police officers. and some bystanders uh, on the scene finding out what happened. And um, Columbo arrives. He screeches to a halt in the Peugeot. (laughs) And he has a hard-boiled egg on hand. (laughs) He's trying to crack it. He's trying to crack it. It's so funny. Apparently, there's a deleted scene. This, again, was from David Koenig's book, where Columbo buys the hard-boiled egg from oh. a food truck. Oh, okay. And that's how it ends up in his pocket or in his hand or whatever. But uh, that got deleted, but the egg is there, and it, it shows up in future episodes too. This hard-boiled egg in his pocket kind of thing. <laughs> Clever. <laughs> it is. It's funny. And I love how the police in this era were just so casual with evidence. They did ask Columbo not to spread his eggshells everywhere. But they're like touching her purse and all the stuff with their bare hands. And, you know, it's just things that we wouldn't do today. But um, I think it took a while before some of those procedures got tightened up a little bit. All right. So let's go to Sharon's apartment, Paul. Okay. Let's do it. Lead me. Okay. What's the address? You know what? I could not find this building. Oh. I didn't spend a ton of time because there's nothing to go on in this um, scene. There's no address mm. or street sign or business name. It's just a building. So I didn't find out where that was. But Dr. Mayfield pulls up in front of Sharon's apartment and waits for Sharon's roommate to leave. And he um, breaks in. Well, he has her keys. He has Sharon's keys, which he's, he stole from her purse and the sutures. So he goes into the apartment. He tries to stage a burglary and he trashes the apartment and he plants some morphine in the bathroom. Um, I do have to say that this apartment is just full of lovely shades of yellow and 1970s green all over like lamps and carpet and couch. And I think probably the best 
My favorite part of the set are these two super furry white pillows, like long fur, long, hairy, furry pillows. They're so cool. I don't know if you noticed those. Yeah, no, I did. They were kind of there. We used to have a pillow similar to that just on the edge, but not like not like a little Yeti gremlin or whatever. Mm-hmm. Those are cool. All right. So that's what happened at Sharon's apartment. Now we're going to go back to the garage and Colombo has been asking for coffee, but all they can find is orange juice. And we have a little cameo <laughs> by our buddy, Mike Lally. Oh, I didn't even notice. Yep, there he is. Whoa, so what, he's the one that gives him the coffee? <laughs> he, or the orange yeah, juice, I the mean? the orange juice. Yep, he delivers the orange oh, man. juice. Oh, good eye. Yeah. Is it yep. in the credits too, though? He's uncredited, but IMDb does have him listed. Yeah, he's not in the actual awesome. credits, but he, I am, yeah. Yeah, Michael Alley. <laughs> Columbo's still trying to peel his eggs. His egg. He's still trying. He's still working on that. And so now it's time for all of us to head into the hospital and find out more about Sharon. Doctor Mayfield heads into his office and puts on his white doctor's coat, and he starts making his regular morning calls. He gets the news about Sharon over the phone. And Columbo comes in right as he's getting the news, and he's also winding the clock on his desk. So this is a big clue for Columbo that he's saying like, oh my goodness, that's so awful. But his concentration is also divided onto this clock. So Yeah, he's, he does not stop, which tells you it's like he almost knows, right? Or, I mean, obviously he knows, but... Yeah, he knows yeah. and he doesn't care. <laughs> He's not yeah. bothered by it at all. Yeah, yeah, because it's just, yeah, it's a perfect clue. Yeah. And this is really similar or reminds me a lot of a clue from... Most Dangerous Game? No, not that one. I was thinking, well, maybe that one too. But the one I was thinking of was Murder by the Book, where Ken Franklin um, murders his writing partner and dumps his body on his front lawn, calls uh, the police. But while he's on the phone, he's opening his mail. Yeah, exactly. And Columbo's like, tell me again exactly what you did when you came home. And he's like, can yeah. I see this open mail? So it's kind of similar. It's the Columbo strategy. Absolutely. Which I guess they used in, uh, they they did use some of his tactics. One of the, or a couple of the police departments, I haven't researched that, but I did hear, I think, William Link talking about that in one of the interviews. It might have been the Television Academy interview with him. Yeah, I don't know what the exact... Oh. specifics are, but I would imagine they're similar. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense that you would want to pay attention to all yeah. those pieces of information. All right. So Columbo meets Dr. Mayfield and uh, tries to learn a little bit more about what's happening at the hospital. And uh, Dr. Mayfield gives Columbo a little bit of sass about his fear, mm-hmm. his fear or his discomfort in the hospital. So he's like the <laughs> unsure fire away and, <laughs> to, to get over that is to stay out of hospitals. Oh, uh, yeah. It's pretty good. Okay, it's time to go check in on Marsha, Sharon's awesome roommate. So Columbo leaves the hospital, heads over to Sharon's apartment, and um, is interviewing Sharon's roommate, Marsha Dalton, I think is the last name. She is so good in her role. She She brings, like, just this, this great comedy to the moment here. Yeah, I need a need a towel, but she's so good. She's a, she was in a movie um, that I w- always was curious about called Serial, S E R I A L. She's older in that one and married. That movie's about suburbia. It's about people living in the Bay Area. And Martin Mull is the main character, and he he t- he bikes to the ferry, and the ferry takes him into San Francisco. So he does this every day with a bunch of other men. And you can see where the movie Mr. Mom, John Hughes's script, definitely, I think, saw Serial. I, I want to say that, yeah, very different. Serial is much more uh, dark. It has uh, deals with a lot of different things, divorce, uh, suicide. There's a lot of different characters in that m- movie, but um, I wanted to see something else she was in. She was in an episode of Night Stalker, but I didn't get a chance to see uh, the episode. Um, but yeah, she's great. She's so funny. And so believable. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't, it's almost like she's not acting. She's, <laughs> she's yeah. just got all these problems going on for real. <laughs> totally. 
This is my favorite line. I selfishly enjoy being around middle to upper middle class people. However, I don't meet any single men unless they're ready for facelifts. Yeah, it's great how she just automatically is confessing to him I love about that. not being as, you know, caring for the world as her roommate. <laughs> exactly. And Columbo's like, what? Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, he doesn't, he doesn't quite get it. And then he starts to get it. She reminds me a lot of the mom, not her necessarily her personality, but the mom in Deadweight, who is a, a relatively small character, but just brings so much to it. They're just like this awesome little bonus. She has another couple scenes, but she's not a huge, doesn't have a huge role, but just really yeah. brings a lot. I think if, I think for these shows, I think it's so smart to do that. I don't know. Yeah, just it's it's like another color, you know, for your painting, it's like something different that maybe you don't expect or, but yeah. And it's really well thought out too, you know, like very believable. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they're roommates too, because out here in Los Angeles, there's so many people in Pasadena somewhat, there's so many people who come out here for a while, have roommates, and then, you know, different things happen. You know, we, you know, that they, they go back to where they, they originally were. And I've worked with different people who were here for a while and then, you know, went back home different reasons, but the roommate situation for sure, you know, it's like just, you know, you just, it's so expensive here. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. There's a, a cool shot. There's, I mean, there's a lot of cool shots in, in this apartment after mm -hmm. they find the morphine. Columbo and the lab tech are looking down and Marsh is looking in and the three cops are all looking around. It's a cool little shot of all five of them crowded around that looking for fingerprints on the, the morphine. So um, it was a cool scene. All right, Paul, it is time for a party. I'm already at the Are party, man. I already got my plate of... I know. Me too. You got your plate. I got my, the my lovely, appetizer. Lovely, uh, um, lady brought this to me, explained everything about it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're heading now to the party at Dr. Mayfield's house. This is where we got our snack and drink. So the uh, wait person, wait staff, greets Columbo and offers him salmon on toast with sour cream and caviar. I have a feeling this is kind of an old school appetizer. I was Googling this recipe and there's not a ton, but... I got to say, I really, I'm really enjoying my vegan version and I do, I do eat fish on occasion. I can imagine with smoked salmon and caviar, it would also would be super delicious. Yeah. The crab legs really good and the, everything else. <laughs> the crumb. Yeah. Don't eat it as fast as Columbo, Paul. You're going to get a stomach ache. And then the drink is champagne. I don't, it's, I don't really know exactly that that's what everyone's drinking, but it looks like that's what Dr. Mayfield is drinking is a little glass of champagne. So and this, according to IMDb, this scene was filmed in Woodland Hills. So this is like over the hills from L.A. proper. It's like near Calabasas, so a little outside the town. But there is a house on Delita Drive, 20, uh, 20349 Delita Drive, Woodland Hills, where this uh, supposedly was filmed. But if you do sort of a satellite view, it absolutely maps on to what you see in this scene. Four bedroom, four bathroom, 3,200 square feet with a pool. And it last sold in 1974 for $150,000. So it's it's been in the same family for many, many years now. But you can see the view that looks out over, this, over the valley and looks down onto the road where Columbo's car is coming up. That would be Moreno or Del Moreno Drive. And this house is estimated to be worth about $2.2 million now, but it's not on the market. So, so Columbo drives up. He arrives. He's offered salmon on toast with sour cream and caviar. He foolishly does not take this delicious appetizer, but he does help himself to the buffet, and he loads up his plate. And Leonard Nimoy says, try the crab leg. Yeah, exactly, which is what you're having. And he gets olives and, I don't know, cheese. It looks like maybe he has roast beef on his plate. Anyhow, so he's there to talk to, to Dr. Mayfield. They go sit at a table 
a little bit of ways from the party out by the pool. And, um, and Columbo is eating way too fast. <laughs> he doesn't have any leads. It's so fun to watch him eat. I don't know why, <laughs> but it's just fun. Well, I have a feeling he's, he's trying not to act at all. He's just, what would I be doing? Yeah. Oh, this looks good. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it is roast beef. Yeah. Paul, I have a big announcement here. I think he's wearing different shoes in this episode. So if you pause at 29 minutes, mm-hmm. 23 seconds, and look at his shoes, they look new. They're definitely dusty, dirty, but they have oh, thicker they do have soles. Thick soles huh? And huh, they're yeah. darker. So I was like, am I imagining this? Did he ch- get new shoes? You know, how do I find out? I looked back at Requiem for a Falling Star. You can see his boots in that episode pretty well, especially at 57 minutes, 16 seconds. <laughs> you know, I went down a little bit. You know, this may be too much information here. But, uh, you know, his boots are such a part of his personality, yeah. his shoes. And they, they look like the old beat-up ones in Requiem. And then in this scene, they look kind of new. So I wonder if those shoes just got too old and bit the dust and it was time for another pair. Yeah, it doesn't look like the ones in, D- in Most Dangerous Match when he lifted up his leg because he got it wet in the elevator shot. Mm-hmm. You can see his shoes there too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So so Colombo gets a tummy ache and Dr. Mayfield gives him some kind of antacid or something. And I've got to say that Dr. Mayfield looks pretty stylish. Leonard Nimoy is pretty stylish Uh in this scene. He's got a navy blue turtleneck on and some matching blue plaid pants and some cool, like, short black boots. Yeah, it made me wonder, was he kind of a sex symbol for a while? Or, you know, as Spock, was that, like, was that not cool enough for him to be... Well, I think I think I read that a lot of women found him very attractive and sexy as Spock. Yeah, oh. in, in uh, yeah, one okay. of his uh, books, he's he he's he wrote a couple of biographies. I am not Spock, which he got a lot of flack for that. And then I am Spock. Uh. That's the one I wanted to find out about him and and Peter Falk, but I did I didn't uh, didn't research as much as I had you know. So I didn't find anything because he is such a, I think Leonard Nimoy is a really good actor. But yeah, in the I Am Spock, he, I think it was there, he talked about women and when he would go to, he would do like, he would go to, he took anything he could because he knew his heart as an actor to have a going career. I mean, because, you know, there's only a certain amount of people in the percentage of actors who doing it full time, but there, there is a big number. There, there, there is a really big number. He, um, had this actor friend who I think it was Darren from combat and Twilight Zone, the movie died at, during the making of Twilight Zone the movie. I, oh. I might've been him, but told him, you know, it's hard to stay to get, keep getting, he had, he had, he had friends who were actors too, who their careers, they would get a, a TV show and then it would disappear mm-hmm. and then they couldn't have anything. Mm. You know, we, we knew, yeah. we knew people out here who, who got in the house and then the, the husband, he's a, he's a very successful actor, but at this time, he thought he was going to keep getting this certain amount of money, and he didn't. Yeah. And they had to, you know, things didn't work out yeah. the, the way they thought. So in his mind, he said he's always always working, and he would take a gig at a county fair as Spock in Maryland. Oh, wow. But he would have people ask him questions, say, do you know that there's hundreds of us who find you very attractive, you know? <laughs> uh, you know, like there's a there's all these women women uh, not women but Star Trek fan base clubs, um, but there was a book or one club that was all about just women and him or something. <laughs> so I don't remember the whole thing, um, but it is kind of interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think he was a you know, uh, you know, kind of a sex symbol, perhaps. Well, I could see that more here in this scene. You know, he looks pretty dapper. He's not. He doesn't have the didn't he have ears? He had little... Uh, yeah, he had the pointy ears. Yeah, so he, you know, without his ears and his eyebrows, he looks pretty good. I love the dialogue <laughs> of, the, of the party guests. You mean like the woman talking about surgery? Yes. I mean, that's like the de- the director, but that was really high Aberbach. Yeah, he's a big di- director. That was really smart because it's almost like a Robert Altman film where you hear these people talking about kind of funny things, but it gives you a sense of people at a party, you right. know, just talking about random things 
Yeah, no, I noticed that too, Paul. I'm glad you brought that up because I wasn't, I flipped my mind, but there's two men, they're like talking about a pediatrician or something. It's like, oh man, not again. Yeah. With yep. the pediatrician, or you're like, what? What is that conversation? <laughs> I don't know. Yes, and part of the reason is because the background actors, they don't want anybody talking. Yeah. And you can usually tell, especially on even today's sitcoms or, you know, How I Met Your Mother or whatever, yeah. you see people miming or talking. And it's always fun to, to me, I've said before, just to watch them to see how they react, nodding their head. But here, it makes it so much more interesting and real. Absolutely. No, that was a good call by the director. Yeah, and that little plastic surgery conversation was funny. Yeah. I was like, are those friends of Marsha's? Uh, <laughs> what's the connection yeah, here? Who, who are the friends here? Yeah. All right. Well, Paul, it's time to go for a walk. Let's go burn off some of those uh, crab legs and caviar. We're going to go for a walk on the pier. And this next scene is uh, the opening shot is of Malibu Pier. Oh, okay. And according to IMDb, there's a little B-roll of a different ocean, a, a different uh, beach. Oh, I love the montage. Yeah, it was nice. It was a nice um, a nice uh, edit job there. There's a little bit of confusion. IMDb says that actually it lists two locations for this pier, Malibu Pier and Huntington Beach Pier. But I'm pretty sure this is the Malibu Pier. Malibu Pier has a wooden railing, and you can see a a restaurant in the background. The Huntington Beach Pier has a metal railing in it still today, and uh, you know, in the seventies when I, I found some historical photos. So it's a different looking pier. There is a building on the Huntington Pier, but it is not a cafe or restaurant. It's a bait uh, a bait shop. Oh yeah, I really like Huntington Beach. I did a couple plays down there. Oh yeah, that's right. And we went to the beach one day and it was wonderful. It was really crowded, but it was it was perfect, you know, it was like yeah. so nice. Yeah, it looks really pretty. And the piers both the piers look really nice. Um and in this scene, so Marsha so after Colombo leaves um Dr. Mayfield's house, Dr. Mayfield calls Marsha to check in on her, but of course, you know, his gears are turning and he's trying to to scheme a little more information for Colombo. So Mayfield goes out to the pier, walks along the pier with Marsha, trying to get pull some information out of her to make it seem like she's coming up with the information. But we both know he's planting it. Not planting it exactly, but he's really fishing for some specific information from Marsha about Sharon's ex-boyfriend, Harry Alexander. I just have to say that Marsha looks awesome in this scene. <laughs> yeah. Stripe. <laughs> yeah. Cool. She's got a really cool look, uh, orange silky blouse with a black and white striped sweater vest on top and some white pants. And uh, we get a little bit more of Marsha's magic here. She's really an appreciating, enjoying Dr. Mayfield's attention. And she wants this meet up to continue. She's like, what should we do next? <laughs> yeah. He's like, well, we got to get you home. And she's like, oh, she's clearly, clearly disappointed. <laughs> yeah. But he convinces her that she's uncovered a very important clue and she needs to call Columbo right away and let him know. And he takes her back to her apartment. You can hear her getting out of her car. She's like, you want to come up for a drink? And he's like, oh, I really have to go. She's like, uh -huh. there wouldn't be any trouble. He's like, maybe another time. She's like, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> she's trying so hard. So she's back at her apartment, but Columbo's waiting for her. So she gets to invite Columbo into her apartment. Yeah, he's kind of <laughs> hiding like out. He's like hiding her. out. It is very unusual. I wonder, there was a deleted scene there that explained why Columbo's hiding in the bushes outside of uh, her mm -hmm. apartment. Well, he definitely didn't want the yeah. doctor to see him. But why not? Oh, yeah, because it put more threat into him. Well, he knew, he knows yeah. how smart this guy is, right? So he's really, maybe maybe just that whole, yeah, maybe that's like he's thinking like, uh, maybe I have to be a little, little more yeah. quiet. Maybe. That's a good question. I don't know. It's funny, though. It definitely adds a little comedy to have him hiding in the bushes there. And then he sneezes and kind of surprises <laughs> yeah. Marsha. Or maybe that's the thing too, is like, how would he get the pollen or yeah. be sneezing? Yeah, Why? Because be he's in the bushes. So, yeah. Like you said. 
Maybe he thought he saw a nice flower for Mrs. Columbo or something. <laughs> yeah. Or for his cousin. But there's a really funny moment here where she's like, well, come on in. And, you know, I, I was just thinking of it in the context of she just tried to get Dr. Mayfield to come in. So Columbo is kind of like her consolation prize. <laughs> he is her consolation. <laughs> yeah. So she's like kind of excited and she's kind of like, yeah. oh, this guy. Well, okay, well, it's better than nobody, I guess. Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I thought I would took it as just she's she trusts him. You know, like she she seems like a giving kind person. And she opens up quickly, obviously. And so she's like, oh, it's this guy again. So her energy with him, you know, she's kind of, I didn't see it as the consolation prize, though. I did. I did. And then, Paul, there's something in Dr. Koenig's, David Koenig's, this is champagne talking now, <laughs> David Koenig's <laughs> Dr. Koenig. He, he is a doctor of words. So there's something in the book where actually originally this scene was going to be a little bit romantic. Oh. Yeah. With Columbo. Oh, so you were right. Yep. Okay, and so then, so he, originally, she was going to be coy, and she was going to say, "This is this isn't your way of making acquaintance with the members of the opposite sex, is it?" He's like, "No." She puts a friendly hand on his knee and asks, "You're certain that I can't get you something?" Oh, because mm-hmm. she does put her hand on his arm when they're by the pool. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Um, okay. He's her Hold consolation See, prize. But if you hadn't read that in Koenig's book, would you think that? You know, that's true because I, I I definitely noticed at the doorway some kind of funny body language between coming from her. But it might be might be that I had just read this note and then I kind of clued into it a mm. little bit better. But if you rewatch that yeah. with this in mind, it might but actually, I don't know if they even, I don't know that they filmed this, though. They never even filmed this. I think they just wrote it and then they rewrote it. Yeah, I don't know if they if they, if they would were writing as they were filming and they would, different versions, you know. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to read David's uh, section there, but I... Um, you dropped the ball, Paul. I Come dropped on, the ball. Man. Well, I knew you would. <laughs> I I knew you would. (laughs) I did, I did. And uh, did you see David had a thing on, someone had wrote something on uh, why Columbo isn't a good show or something like that? No. Yeah, he said it was a really, he said it was a very fascinating read. Um, He disagrees with the, uh, you know, what their opinion is. But um, uh, yeah, I I was going to read it. And then I was like, you know what? I get, there's so many other things I want to read. I don't want to read someone just. (laughs) Was that something he tweeted about or? Uh, I think it was Instagram. Okay. Yeah. So, right. so maybe you yeah, check that out. Yeah, anyone who's not sure, we're talking about David Koenig, the author of Shooting Columbo, who was on our podcast a few episodes back talking about his book, which is really cool. You should check it out if you don't mm-hmm. have it yet. Yeah. Anyhow, so Columbo goes back to Sharon Mar- and Marsha's apartment, and is Marsha has this information for him. This is another really funny scene, though. Once they're inside, he has to sneeze. He's like, do you have a tissue? <laughs> I need a tissue and she's fumbling. It's just, um, uh, it's a good, it's a good scene. And she shares with him, Harry Alexander. He asks her about Sharon's personal life. And Marcia says, you should look up Harry Alexander. And, um, and then Columbo gets to the bottom of that clue because he's like, well, that's kind of odd. You know, usually people don't know what I'm asking for. And you just threw this name out at me. So she, sort of spills the beans that she was with talking with Dr. Mayfield and the, you know, they kind of came upon the name or whatever. You know what? M- maybe part of the reason he wanted to hide is because he's actually looking into, you know, he doesn't have anything. So if, if he does see her going back to there, maybe, well, I guess he didn't know about the, yeah. Cause, cause they found the morphine and didn't, um, Leonard Nimoy gave him the information about this guy at the party, right? Not yet. No, not yet. What what information did he give? He well, Dr. Mayfield at the party, Dr. Mayfield asked, uh, did you get anything from Marsha, the roommate? And Columbo's like, Yeah, no, she didn't really know anything. And then that prompts Mayfield to call Marsha. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So, huh. I guess they were following him. Right? Mayfield? Yeah, or no? Or he's just why did why did he decide to go back to her office then, or to her house? I think he was he was hoping to get a little more. I don't know. He thought he could get more information somehow yeah. from her. But yeah, maybe there was some other plot point that we don't know about. You know? Because if he said he didn't get anything from her, 
Um, but I guess if you find the morphine there, why is morphine there? Right. What's the whole and point? And she of was pretty upset when he first interviewed her. So maybe he thinks now she's calmed yeah. down a bit and they could have a better conversation. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. All right. Well, it's time to check in on Dr. Heidemann to see how he's doing. And uh, Columbo gets into his his hospital room with a cigar. And I love this line from Dr. Heidemann. He's like, that's the first human thing I've smelled in two days. Yeah. And so Columbo's allowed to hang out in the hospital room with his stinky cigar. And uh, he tries to get a little bit more information from Dr. Heidemann about Sharon. Uh, Dr. Mayfield shuts it down. He comes in and, and, and shuts it down right away under the pretense that, you know, Dr. Heidemann can't be bothered. He needs to be needs to, uh, you know, rest and recover or whatever. I know I already talked about this idea of like researchers murdering each other, but then I was also wondering what about murderous doctors? I know there's murderous doctors. So I don't know that there's any doctor who's murdered in this specific way, but there are, there have been several physicians over the years, even over like the century, like a couple of centuries documented physicians who purposefully murdered their patients. Um, and there's actually a fairly recent case from Texas from 2011 where this there was this crazy surgeon who was purposefully hurting his patients while performing surgery, and he actually killed two of them. But luckily he has been arrested. And Did they say um, point to things about that individual? I didn't read too much about it. I think he just, had a, he just was a really messed up person who just – enjoyed hurting others unfortunately um yeah so anyhow i was like is this i don't know why i I had to find some true crime this time (laughs) well no it's a good it's a valid uh thing you know yeah i have a few true crime books i have only read a couple of them yeah because they are they you start going down there and yeah they start getting dark and that's not what we're about paul (laughs) But every now and then I want to do a little like fact check, reality check. Is this, re- how probable is this kind of a thing, you know? Yeah. Well, let's let's brighten this up. Let's go see some animals. All right. We're going to go for a pony ride, the Griffith Park pony ride. Do you recognize this park? Um, where was it at? We no, I don't. We have seen it before. Uh, we have seen it before in the Colombo. It was in dead weight. This is the park where Mrs. Stewart worked. Oh, yeah, yeah. With children and animals. Yeah. Oh, the same one. The same one. <laughs> Maybe she yeah. worked with this guy. Yeah, maybe she's friends with Harry Alexander. <laughs> so, yeah, Harry Alexander works in the park. Uh, this park is still open today, uh, supposedly, or maybe not right in the moment, but, it, you know, it still exists. Where is it Griffith at? Park, Griffith Park. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like the petting zoo. Yeah, that's, pony, the, that's where the, rides. the zoo is. Yeah, it's right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We've been there. And um, we meet Harry Alexander. And I don't know, there's this funny little audio loop that keeps repeating in the background in this scene oh wow good catch that i you know i've watched all these many times but and i don't usually catch that kind of thing but for some reason in this episode this repeating audio loop really stands out to me it's a little bit distracting so i I guess maybe they just didn't have enough background noise yeah. Why him and the guy are talking? Well, actually, it's while Columbo's sort of showing up on the scene and finding where Harry Alexander is in the park. And what's the what's the background? Birds? It's like, no, no, it's like, hey, yeah, we got to go. Oh. Something like that. It's, Let's see. <laughs> I know it's just such a like minor detail, but but I'm curious from your oh. perspective, Paul, do you think that they like ran out of 
of uh, do you think they thought nobody would notice or they were like the, yeah they definitely thought nobody would notice um as an assistant editor or as an editor you one of the things you do is you add in background sound for each particular scene you're in so if you're in a coffee shop if you could have an ambient track of people drinking and kind of talking in the background you will have that track underneath i mean in in regular tv shows the sound mix people will have you know 50 tracks mm, wow. it'll be that'll be layered all wow. the way up and they get it they're the ones that do the final um well there's a depending on how big your budget is there's multiple sound places there'll be the people doing a foley which is original sounds like the um, actors so talking? like walking no that's the adr that's separate Oh, okay. Additional, yeah, yeah. That that's in a separate place too, or maybe sometimes it could be the same place. I'm not sure, um, but yeah, the actors will go. They'll have X amount. It's in their contract that they have to do ADR. Uh, well, depending on a big how big the project is, that'll be separate. And then the just the assistant editor, like I'm working on a film now. It's a lower budget film. Tier one is the union, and I will have the editor will give me scenes that they've cut and I, it'll be a scene of a guy in a room. Uh, let's say he works in a, um, he's a telemarketer. So I have to find that kind of stuff that sounds mm -hmm. in the telemarketing mm -hmm. yeah. place. Um, and then if it's someone at home cuts to scenes, somebody at home, I want to repeat that action of what it sounds to be in that neighborhood or is it a, is it a house by itself and nobody's around and, and then you just sort of like, depending on how much you have of that track, if people are talking in the mm -hmm. background, like they use there, you definitely don't want to yeah. repeat that. But on a show like this, the time frame that they have, and the time frame I have on this film is not long. I mean, I'm, I'm, we have seven to eight weeks to finish this. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot of time. So, so for this, they probably put it down, looped it again, like yeah. you said, one place, two place, three place. Because maybe that's all they had, you know, in the room or whatever time it was. And yeah, they're like, just change that. Cause it sounds kind of echoey on one part and then less echoey on another part. So they probably put it, rearranged it a little bit to make it sound a little different, but you caught it. I didn't catch it when I, when I saw it, but the editor I'm working with now, he will, uh, he told me, you know, he'll watch a movie and <laughs> He'd be like, oh, that's from that library. <laughs> that's Oh, how funny. You know, and that's that's because he's worked on, you know, yeah. probably a hundred films or something. I don't know how many films, but big budget, low budget, all kinds of stuff. And uh and and for me, you know, like I have a library and he's given me some stuff to work with. And so yeah, you put you so you do that layer. If Columbo chugged on uh some water, it probably didn't come across off very well and when he actually did it and as yeah. a as a editor or an assistant editor you want to fill in those gaps so mm -hmm. to make it sound even better and then when you send it to the mixer then they make it even cooler you know Smoother. more realistic yeah. you know um so there's different people in different areas uh but a lot of editors and assistant editors on a ton of scripted shows will put all that stuff in and even in the the reality shows you know the crowds and a game show or, uh, you know, America's got talent. I have never worked on that, but I imagine they fill that in with extra clapping and cheering yeah. and all that. Right. Um, and so they have their libraries that they throw in on there. Oh, it's so interesting. But it's interesting how well it connects when you're watching, you know, how perfectly it yeah, so much work. works. Yeah. So much work must go into all those little bits and pieces. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's can be difficult. Yeah. Especially if you're sitting down. I mean, a lot of jobs you sit down, but I stand my table raises. Um, oh, yeah. Cause, uh, it's easy to gain weight and not exercise cause you're, you know, working long hours. Right. Good catch though. Wow. Yeah. It's funny that I, I mean, granted I've watched this a lot. Sometimes I don't catch something, even though I have seen it a lot. And then sometimes something just jumps out at me. This is one of those moments that just 
Well, thanks for sharing all that, Paul. That's really cool. That like um, layering of the sound thing. I think that's. Yeah, I hope I explained it. Well, yeah, okay. no, I think you explained it really well. And we meet Harry Alexander. I thought this actor did a really great job. Yeah, he's uh, good. Jared Martin. He's still doing stuff, I believe. Oh, wow. He felt super genuine. Super, super genuine. Oh, he passed away in 2017. Oh, oh I know. It's so sad, all these Columbo actors who keep losing constantly. Yeah, I thought he just did a great job. And he Columbo believes him mm-hmm. that he genuinely cared for Sharon Martin and that he's genuinely clean and he's not using any drugs anymore. Yeah. So it was just a, a brief scene between the two of them. He was uh, in the fantastic journey with Carl Franklin. who's a wonderful director, did the glass shield. It's funny. It's like, there's Carl Franklin, uh, really good uh, director, but yeah, I've seen him before. I recognized him. Yeah. He was very, he reminds me of, uh, See, he was in War of the Worlds, Westworld, some Italian stuff. Dallas, maybe Dallas is where he was. Dusty Farlow in Dallas. That might be where I reckon he was in Murder She Wrote. He was in a couple episodes. The oh. Love Boat. I mean, he was in everything and you know, television, yeah. Fantasy Island, Knight Rider. So, um, but yeah, no, he he was he was an excellent actor. I wonder how how he was, you know, in real life. He seems very interesting. Yeah. All right, let's go back to the hospital. Colombo is. Digging through a trash can, <laughs> talking to the custodian. I love that. Oh, I meant to look her up. I love the moment. Yeah, the custodian, she was the, great. the um, janitor, she was really good. She gets real quiet as soon as uh, the doctor comes in. <laughs> yeah, you can tell she, he makes her uncomfortable. Like, oh, yeah, I'll see you later. I uh, gotta go. <laughs> gotta get back to work. Yeah, uh, yeah, she was good. And then, um, so Colombo shares with Dr. Mayfield that he doesn't think Harry Alexander is guilty. He believes him. And this, you know, Dr. Mayfield jumps into action again. He, um, just like after his conversation with Columbo at the party, he, when he asks if he got any information from Marsha, Columbo says, no, he immediately calls Marsha. In this scene, he asks what he thought about Harry Alexander and Columbo doesn't, doesn't peg him as the type, he instantly starts, you know, plan B, which is to murder another person. And he gets some of the drugs out of his lab uh, locked cabinet or whatever. And, and so now we go to Harry's apartment, Harry Alexander's apartment. And uh, Dr. Mayfield is clearly up to no good. He breaks into this poor man's apartment and drugs him. Yeah, this was a really dark scene. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. He is going all out, this dude. This whole episode has more of that creepy darkness, you know? Like the surgery scene is a little spooky. And when Dr. Mayfield steps out of the shadows in the parking garage to kill Sharon Martin. That is really spooky. And then this moment for sure. Yeah. This is like a scarier Columbo than average. And they do some, so after he knocks Harry out, he drugs him, he leaves and then Harry wakes up and they do some cool like editing stuff there with like colors and shapes kind of coming across the screen. Yeah, it's kind of funky, definitely of, of the time, weird, surreal. Very dated, yeah. But it's cool, it's cool. Yeah, it changes the, you know, the pacing of the show, what you're watching, pulls you to something new. Um, there's a lot of different stuff in this this particular episode, this, this being one of them, Yeah. this whole section. It's funny because that apartment complex, there are so many places that look like that. I've had two different friends live – in two different places that look like that movies like Tarantino's uh, Jackie Brown. One of the characters lives in a place like that, gets killed in a place like that. Uh, the movie or the, the series true detective season two and the, and the really great teaser for that. A lot of people didn't like that season, but the teaser they made for it, it shows Vince Vaughn and a couple of his men walking through this looks a lot like that place, (laughs) but I think it's just a LA sort of 
structure that they built that all over the place like that. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing in the, I was going to say show notes, but the IMDB notes about where that particular apartment building is located. So I didn't even try to find, you know, where they filmed that. Um, because yeah, again, there's like not enough, there's nothing to go on to dig around really. Unfortunately. Well, Harry, so Harry is drugged and then he falls. I don't know why he leaves his apartment, but you know, he, he wasn't, he was high. So he didn't yeah. know what. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's, I guess say. he could have tried to call somebody, but maybe he's just feels like he can't even do yeah. that. He's got to get out of there. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. Yeah. He's like, maybe, maybe, maybe he thought he was going to be attacked again. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, yeah, exactly. Cause if someone, why would somebody drug me? I got to get out, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then if you've been, yeah uh sober for so long and doing heavy stuff like that yeah I imagine your system and your mind would go like oh no yeah for so sure. did he he just got hurt right he I think he dies did he die I think he dies oh my gosh yeah I forgot yeah. I yeah. watched this I watched the whole episode <laughs> I just <laughs> Yeah, he. I'm pretty sure he falls down the stairs and dies from the fall. Okay. Yeah. So, so then we go back to the hospital again, and Columbo is talking to Mayfield and shares the latest news. And finally, Mayfield realizes that Columbo suspects him in this mm-hmm. moment. He's so yeah. Columbo's like, "Oh, I don't, you know, he didn't. I'm pretty sure he was drugged. Um, someone's, you know, going through an awful lot of trouble to make this guy look guilty or whatever." Mm-hmm. And then Columbo goes to talk to Heidemann to share his concerns and, and says, you know, Sharon was worried about you after the operation. And, you know, maybe you sh- I think this is a scene where he's like, you, mean you might want to get a second opinion. Or wait, no, that's a little bit to later. To Columbo, you mean? That's a little bit later. Or is it this? I can't remember. So, but, but Columbo to Heidemann says, you know, would you want to be seen by another surgeon? Oh, oh, right. To Will Greer. Yeah, yeah, Heidemann. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you want to talk about, I don't know if you wanted to share anything about Will Greer. I didn't look him up, but I know he's done a bunch of other stuff. Doesn't a nurse come in there and shoo him out of there? Where's that nurse? There's a nurse. That was earlier on. A nurse comes in. Oh, Anita Corso. So so Will Greer, apparently, I think, liked her at one time. Oh, really? And oh, no, 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 no. Andy Griffith did. Sorry. Not Will Greer. Andy Griffith. Get your facts straight, Paul. <laughs> because she Come was on. in, she was in uh, the Andy Griffith show. And she ended up being on Matlock years later. Oh. But she was also in The Blob with Steve McQueen, um, which I've only seen uh, like some of it. But it, it, it was cool. What I, what I did see, I, I mean, the song is great. But she was the lead with Steve McQueen in that. Oh, cool. Okay. So Will Greer was in the Waltons. He was like the grandfather. And he's also in another, Dean Hargrove was one of the producers of this, of several seasons of Columbo. Dean Hargrove directed a movie called, I have it right here, called The Manchu Eagle Murder Caper Mystery. Oh. Uh, and it's a it's a comedy. Um, and it's got, Nita Talbot in it. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's got a lot of people that have been in Columbo. Yeah. And uh, and she's great. She's so funny in it. It's a little, like, there's some of the humor. It's definitely like Monty Python. Mm-hmm. Not not like Monty Python. That's not a good comparison. There's, a, there's some adult humor that probably wouldn't go over as well now. Okay, yeah. But it's a very creative film. And Dean Hargrove has said, like, not too long ago, there's a really good interview with him on television academy or maybe the oscar i can't remember what it was but this group interviewed him and he talked briefly about that but he always wondered had he because that was a shoestring budget film and um it's a lot of really strange stuff and cool stuff that happens it's a very different kind of film it's a detective type of story but it's a comedy and will greer in that plays a crazy doctor. Oh, wow. <laughs> like kind of a loony doctor. Uh-oh. It's a silly, it's, it's got a lot of silly elements to it. Yeah. Um, it, and it reminds me of the Agatha Christie murder by death with Peter Falk. Okay. And yeah. Alec Guinness. It, it's kind of has kind of plays like that. I haven't actually seen that, but I know the one you're talking about. Yeah. Truman yeah. Capote's in it. Okay. A lot of, yeah, that's an interesting film. I, I, I've, I've seen it at least once. 
know, I wouldn't mind watching it again. Yeah. So, but in this, this uh, Nita, Nita's in it and Will Greer's in it. And uh, Dean Hargrove has wondered, had he gone into directing, you know, where where he would have gone? You know, how how would that have turned out? That's one thing that he just said momentarily in that interview, he did wonder, you know, but he was a great television producer. Yeah. You know, because this is really, to me and you, I think, you know, this is one of the better seasons uh, shows that just holds up in a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So was that the movie you just showed me? The man, what's it called? Yeah, so it's the, the Manchu Eagle murder uh, caper mystery. Was that before or after this was filmed? Um, that's a good question. Because I wonder if this inspired uh, Greer's portrayal of his uh, doctor character at all, if he had just played a doctor or vice versa. Yeah, um, definitely around the same. This was, not, oh, so this, this was later, 1975. Okay. So. Maybe not. Uh, it might have taken him a while, to, to, but everybody who was in this, he said, you know, I don't think they got paid much. Yeah. I think they got paid. I can't remember, but um, they, they liked Dean, you know. Yeah. And so they all they all kind of jumped at the chance to like, yeah, let's do it. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he was in Jeremiah Johnson, actually, with uh, Robert Redford. I wanted to watch that. I actually rented it and didn't have any time. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I I stretch myself too thin. Yeah. My you family can't do it all. I can't do it recognizes all. sometimes. Yeah. Okay, well, we're getting we're getting towards the end here. Um Columbo stumbles on a really important clue when he's talking to Dr. Heidemann, which is that MAC on Sharon's note is Marcus and Carlson Medical Supply Company. So he is putting two and two together that Mac wasn't a guy. It was She was going to talk to the medical supply company. So Columbo goes to the... Um, like the administrative offices or whatever, talks to someone who's a purchaser or whatever for the hospital. And we get a little lesson in sutures here. Uh, we have a little a little uh, comedy moment where Columbo's watching, asked to watch a surgery. And he's like, Ugh, <laughs> <laughs> please not. Can you just describe yeah. to me? And, um, and so this is when Columbo really starts to figure out what's probably what Sharon figured out, which is that, the sutures were the wrong kind. And so Columbo goes in and talks to Mayfield and kind of confronts him and says um, that, I can't remember exactly what he says. Oh yeah. No, I think he, he lays it all out for, yeah. for Mayfield, right? He says, you know, you could have died the sutures. Mayfield starts laughing at Columbo. Oh, you're talking about the last scene. Not the that's, last scene. That's not the last scene. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, We're no, you're right, you're right. almost the last scene, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he starts laughing. He starts laughing, and Columbo loses it. It's like one of his really rare rage moments where he grabs this coffee carafe and, like, slams it on the table, and he says, like, you better take good care of Dr. Mayfield, or Dr. Heidemann, because if something happens to him, we're going to have to have an autopsy. And um, it sounds like reading Koenig's book that Columbo improvised this sort of rage moment that, that, you know, he was, he had the lines, but the fact that he picked up that carafe and slammed it, that was his addition to the scene. I wondered if the laughter was improvised too. Mm. I thought this when I saw it. That's why I wanted to find out about it, but I just didn't have the, didn't make the time. But because Leonard Nimoy, if you look at him, his reaction, his face is red and he looks like, and his, he delivers his line perfectly. He's like, you really are remarkable, you know. Mm-hmm. But the laughter, I loved it. And it's funny that Peter Falk would lose it. Yeah. Or Columbo would lose it. Because mm-hmm. I was thinking Leonard Nimoy killed it when he was laughing at him. You know, like mm-hmm. like if it wasn't in the script, maybe it was in the script. So I wondered, I was like, and St. John, my wife said the same thing. She's like, that didn't seem like Peter Falk was acting. It yeah. seemed like he really <laughs> got to him. Yeah, he really got mad. Mm-hmm. Totally. So... But yeah, no, now that you mentioned that that was improvised, I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah, that was, a, that was a cool moment. And I had to look up, there have been a few other times where Columbo loses it. This, you know, Columbo file, that blog we've talked about many times, which is a great resource, has, mm-hmm. a, has a whole blog post on the, on the various times that Columbo loses it, where he gets super angry. And this happens in um, Prescription Murder, the very first episode where he gets really mad at um, 
the girlfriend, I can't remember her name, but he's trying to push her over the line. And then also in two more, which we haven't watched yet, we haven't discussed yet. I, I mean, I've seen them, but um, Exercise in Fatality and Deadly State of Mind, he really also loses it in those scenes. So, Oh, also in the, did you, Death Lends a Hand? Did you say that one? Oh, he gets angry when there. When pa- Patty tries to hit him, the actress, the little, the younger. Oh, right. No, Ransom for a, Ransom for a Dead Man. Oh, Ransom for Dead Man. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's true. He's not as, doesn't get as angry, but he's... He's forceful. He definitely gets angry. That's true. All right. So Dr. Mayfield gets the message that Columbo is on to him and he takes drastic action. It's similar to what he does in the other scenes that I mentioned where, you know, as soon as he finds out Marsha hasn't been helpful, he calls her. As soon as he finds out Harry is not a sus- suspect, he attacks him. And as soon as he finds out Columbo suspects him, he goes to the nurse's station and add some kind of extra medication to Dr. Heidemann's medicine that's going to, you know, give him a, a sort of medical crisis that Dr. Mayfield can say, oh, it's the valve. We need to do a, another surgery. It's not functioning. So this all happens. Heidemann gets really ill from a medicine and Mayfield orders an emergency surgery. This time, Colombo and some other doctors are there to watch and at the end of the surgery, Columbo asks everyone except Dr. Mayfield to stay put and have, you know, be searched. So they, they search the, the whole uh, operating room and everyone who's in there looking for the old suture. And Mayfield kind of loses it in this moment and pushes, in this moment, pushes Columbo out of the way. And, uh, and the search continues and they can't find the sutures. And then we have the final scene, which is a really good gotcha moment. So Columbo goes to tell Mayfield they could never find the sutures. I can't remember if he says, I have to congratulate you or what, but he's like, you know, you won and or whatever, something to that effect in this final scene. And when the surgery is done, he goes like this. Yeah, with his hair. (laughs) Before people were doing that. (laughs) Paul's just sort of smoothing the the hair on his. Oh yeah, I'm so sorry. (laughs) I'm such an idiot, dear listener. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he does that. Such a good moment there, for sure. Staring at Columbo while he does it, and then so Columbo leaves, and Dr. Mayfield exhales. He's like, ah, you know, and then Columbo bursts back in. He's like, he almost got away with it, and. Mm He pulls the sutures out of his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and that and that is it. That's that's the end of Dr. Mayfield right there. It's almost like uh I feel like he would have you know, like that that, that one definitely stays in Columbo's side, you know. Like all, all the episodes do, obviously, but that was pretty clever mm-hmm. of the Dr. Barry Mayfield. Yeah, for sure. He had to be so fast. He had to have like magician hands to mm-hmm. take the suture and slip them into the pockets, into Columbus' pocket. But yeah, it's pretty good. It's a pretty good ending. Well, so now we're going to wrap up here. And um, we like to rate each episode of Columbo from 1 to 10. And uh, Paul, I don't know if you have your number in mind, but I have my number in mind for this one. Let's hear it. All right. I got to say this one has... Some really great characters. You know, we got Marsha and even Nurse Sharon does an exceptional job. Dr. Heidemann's really fun. The monkey, we got the cameos by the cute monkey. (laughs) Um, We have some really fun moments like the egg, uh, the hard boiled egg, you know, Columbo overeating conversations (laughs) with Marsha. You know, I love a good party scene. So I think I'm going to give this one like a nine out of 10. What? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, this one is excellent. That's a good rating. Yeah, I, I'm going to give it a uh, 86 out of okay. 100. 8.6 okay. out of 10 um, okay. or 8.69 out of 10. <laughs> oh, okay. I like it. But, I like uh, it. but yeah, the, the <laughs> script uh, by Cheryl Hendricks, that person, that guy, he did great. And uh, Jackson Gillis was, was one of the story editors. Okay. It said story editor consultant. So yeah, I think this is one of the best scripts that I watched so far because it's so for the how to trick, how to get away with something, you know, kind of 
like how to, I mean, a lot of times it's accidents or this was an accident in some ways because she was on to him. So he's like, right. you know, it wasn't like he's like the Dostoevsky thing, trying to plan the perfect murder. None of the characters right. I don't think ever do. Or maybe the prescription murder guy does sort of, but yeah, there's just something about the, how he does like just, it's just so it seems real and dark and the performances. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Leonard Nimoy, he, he was, uh, I've watched a lot of his stuff, but yeah, he's great in this. He's, he's, uh, he's nice to him at the party. Like, Oh yeah, mm-hmm. let me get something for you. You know, he keep he keeps it very interesting. Yeah. Always watching and like really reacting to when Columbo is like looking at the morphine cabinet and he's like, wait a minute, are you, are you saying I, you, you might think yeah. I, it's like, you can tell he's already been thinking that, but now right. he's at the point where he's got to say something to him and the laughing thing. I yeah. love that. I thought, I thought Columbo getting mad is Peter Falk getting mad Yeah, in a way because that, that him doing the, that kind of thing, but it made it real too. As you, uh, you know, like you said it, some of the later ones with Patrick McGowan, he does a little bit of that. Um, it's uh, exercise and fatality. You mean the rage, the getting really mad? Yeah, the um, rage Exercise thing, and yeah. fatality, which is with the man. I can't remember his name. But no, you're not talking about Patrick McGowan. You're talking about somebody else? No, not Patrick McGowan, actually. Oh, Deadly State of Mind. Deadly State of Mind. Oh, okay. You don't know the actor? And no, and that's actually a woman. Um, he gets really angry with um, a researcher who is possibly covering up, not even intentionally, but like she's covering up for the, for the murderer. And he gets really mad. He's like, I'm talking to you about a murder. <laughs> she's, she's kind of trying to blow Columbo oh, okay. off. He's like, this is serious stuff. Yeah. And, and the, the music, Billy Goldenberg's music is great. And those, those scenes oh, you're talking yeah. about in the beginning, the, 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 the mm-hmm. operation scenes, the those are great, scenes. really yeah. intense. Yeah. I really enjoyed watching it. Yeah, Leonard Nimoy, it's funny because his Spock character is supposed to keep the emotions as a Vulcan. He's half human, half Vulcan. And, you know, he always followed him around. So he would do different roles in theater. Um, But he worked with Ingrid Bergman in her last film. They filmed it in Israel. Yeah, there's just watching his Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the Philip Kaufman film. He plays a guy who is a best-selling writer who's also sort of a therapist, psychiatrist, I can't remember, but he's telling his friends like Donald Sutherland, Brooke Adams, like, they're like, you know, my husband's changed or something wrong. It's, he's not the same person. He's like, he's like, just because they're not acting the way you think they should, but he's really, he's really already an alien. I think I, I, I oh. haven't watched the, the whole film in a long time. Creepy. Yeah. So he was great and creepy in that. Um, Mm-hmm. But he, yeah, he studied with Jeff Corey, who did a lot of westerns, and he, I think Jeff Corey actually made a movie too. I interviewed Louise Fletcher years ago when I was in college, the lady who was in uh, Cuckoo's Nest. She won the Ox- Best Actor Oct- Actress. So. Oh yeah, okay. And uh, I think she knew Jeff too, and um, she had mentioned something about that film that he made, Jeff Corey made. But yeah, he wanted to get out of the. Leonard Nimoy wanted to get out of the idea of he could only play Spock, but the critics yeah, would always right. say something about that. He actually can be funny. He doesn't, he's Spock actually, you know, <laughs> because that's that show only had three seasons, mm-hmm. but it, it had such a huge following and gradually built and built. And then they did the movies, you know, 10 years later, the first one. There were only three seasons of, of the original Star Trek. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I had no yeah, idea. Yeah, that's how like it slowly built, you know, the the fan mm-hmm. base or actually it built quickly, but the numbers I guess weren't there for the for for the network. But what what's interesting is that what if it had gotten huge numbers, he really would have been just seen as Spock. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, you know, so it could have been even harder, but he did um he did a play based on another guy's play on Vincent van Gogh's brother, Tio. Mm-hmm. And he rewrote it, and he researched it, and oh, wrote. Wow. And, and I've seen. I saw it, they they filmed it for A and E. But he loved art, and and his his first wife and second wife. I think both were did as well. Well, his first wife, I think, was an actress. I think you know he's a photographer. He's a poet, and and uh, oh wow, yeah. Like the more I read, and the more I would 
see some of the stuff, the more you see how serious and I think he's a really great actor. He was so believable mm-hmm. in this role. Yeah, he was. Uh, Is there another thing he did that you think would be really good to watch? Good performance besides Star Trek, obviously. Yeah, I liked Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Um, I think Philip Kaufman is one of the better directors of the 80s and the 90s. Okay, that's a good one. I think I've seen that one, so I could do for watching that one again. I would like to see some of these other things he did, like The Outer Limits. Um, He was in a... His son directed an episode. I wanted to see this Western he did. I'd like to... I know he did a lot of the theater. Um, And he hosted In Search Of which was uh, like in search of missing people, in search of strange strange oh. phenomena, in search of... Interesting. Yeah, and so he did several seasons of that, like more than Star Trek. I think it was like six seasons of that, something like that. And he was the host. I've never even heard of that. And you know what? That's one of the earliest shows I remember as a kid. And I used to love that show. And um, Oh, cool. Yeah, and he did one episode, was like in search of Vincent Van Gogh. And it was like, was he a madman? Some people said he was. And he actually went to where Van Gogh's from and went to the area where he was born. Mm-hmm. Vincent Van Gogh had a brother who died uh, really young. Maybe he was still born. I'm not sure. But his name was Vincent Van Gogh. And supposedly, oh, supposedly his parents, <laughs> his mom would take him to the grave his brother's grave all oh, the time no. with the same name. Not a good, not a good parenting move right there. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's crazy. So besides the, you know, maybe the drinking and, and not being mm-hmm. successful as a painter uh, fueled some of the, you know, the tearing of the ear, the cutting of the ear. But with all the hundreds of letters that he and his brother wrote to each other, he clearly was not, had a heart, you know, um, was was very depressed, obviously, Van Gogh, but but he reads he he does part of his play I think in that in search of that episode oh, in wow. search of Vincent Van Gogh and um okay. and it was great like he's in his brother Tio's room the actual room uh, that I think he stayed in and I think he's doing some of the lines and he was so compelling like it started to uh, cheer me wow. up so I would say probably one of his plays because he yeah. the plays that he did got really good reviews and he toured a lot with them. Um, so those I think would be interesting, you know, film plays are always kind of tough cause it's like static camera, a couple different yeah. angles. It's not as interesting, but I'm trying to think what else he might've done, but this is a, you know, besides this, um, the night gallery. Oh, you know what? I watch a night gallery episode called she'll be company for you. I think it's actually the same set that Requiem for a dream oh, Requiem really? for a, <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking too fast. This is where people get confused. Champagne. This is a champagne. Yeah, I said a teeny bit, but that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> that the, the lady, the Ann Baxter's room, that's his house. Yeah. Oh, how funny. Yeah, because it has the same glass doors. So anyway, this this cat, this, someone leaves him a cat. It's kind of a long thing, but he's really good. There, there, there are moments where he's not good. Yeah. Where his his acting is like, oh, okay, he's still learning. And I imagine they didn't have any rehearsal time. Night Gallery oh, was like a lot of these shows, but, um, and you know, you have to develop your character and it's only one episode, Yeah. but he has to have fear. And, but there are some other moments where he's really good in that episode. He's very different. He's very expressive, very angry, scared. Uh, so yeah. there's parts where he's not good and other parts where he's great. Mission Impossible. Uh, he was oh, Paris. Okay. Yeah. So he was like in the fourth, started in the fourth season. And a lot of people will tell you that you don't really get to find out about the characters in those shows. It's all about how are they going to yeah. do this, you know, impossible mission. It's all about the plot. And so it's yeah. just technical. They're talking. How are we going to do this? Okay, John, I want you to go here. You're going to go through the tunnels, blah, 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 blah. And that's all it is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he did play like a Fidel Castro type character in the first one. Okay. So we both gave our rating. And now, um, Usually, you've got some trivia for me. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got some trivia for me, Paul? I got some trivia for you. Well, quiz, pop quiz, true, false. True, false. So, I don't know if you remember the detective, Victor Milan, Detective Flores. He comes into the end and he's in the garage. Yes. Uh, I thought yep. that guy was really good. Um, he was in mm-hmm. Touch of Evil, Orson Welles. 
great film. Okay. Especially his restored, uh, Orson Welles' restored version, the version that he had notes on, and he gave a six-page or 65-page thing to Universal, or I can't remember who distributed it, um, but it has Charlton Heston, Victor Milan. Victor Milan is set up in this. He's Orson Welles is a dirty cop, mm. and he is so good. Okay. A lot of great performances in that. He was in that, and I, he was in Giant. He had scenes with uh, uh, James Dean, Mercedes McCambridge, Back to the trivia question. Victor Milan is one of mom's favorite uh, actors. <laughs> oh, Paul. Mm, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say that's false. You're right. <laughs> yes. Because I think he's a little too obscure for mom. <laughs> Mom's like Sean Connery. I actually know? thought that she, that she had told me about him. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, and she, I called her today, and she's like, who? She's like, what? <laughs> I was like, he was in Scarface. He was in he was in Scarface, but he doesn't say anything. I wonder if they cut his lines. He speaks Spanish in a lot of his films okay. and English. Um, but I saw one called Boulevard Nights, uh, which was interesting, and um, he plays the dad to one of the main characters in uh, very few lines, you know. So, okay, I didn't get you there. Dang it. No, you didn't get me. <laughs> um, what you got? Number, number two. two uh, let's see. Uh, so the um, the movie I saw the most in the theater, uh, Leonard Nimoy was the main star. You're smiling really big right now, Paul. I'm going to say that's false. Come on. Think about it. <sighs> Is it true? I don't know. Is it true or false? You tell me. I don't know. But, I don't know, know what You want to go with is. true or false? I'm going to go with false. I'm going to go with my first reaction. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> what? What movie is this? It's called Destiny in Space. Oh, my goodness. How many times did you see uh, it? I saw it probably. <laughs> uh, let's see. Get it out. I lived in Milwaukee for uh, close to a year. I worked at the the opening. The, the IMAX theater opened there with Mike Schlitt was my boss. Really cool guy. We would talk about. So as yeah. at, at the IMAX theater, um, I had to work there, and I would have to scrub the image. So I had a clicker. If a little piece of dust got on the the projector, because it was seventy millimeter, it projects huge. Yeah. Uh, because they they have multiple cameras that they sort of connect. And um, it's very. If you see a film in, in an IMAX theater, it's very beautiful. So he narrated Destiny in Space, the Great uh, Ullamans okay. Volcano. Like he was, <laughs> like his voice. Like so, I had to watch the film. Uh, I got to talk to Mike yeah. sometimes. He would call me, and we would talk about Scanner Darkly. He told me about Philip K. Dick's book. But yeah, I said I had to watch the film. So we had that to for watch for the dust. Yeah, for the dust to clean it off. As soon as yeah. something got in there, I had to okay. clean it off. Okay. So, oh man, what a job! Paul. Uh, yeah, a job. we we had. I was there. We had that was there the longest when I was there. Okay. Yeah, great, great voice. He had such a good voice. Um, yeah, he does. And developing the character, you know, this the way his uh, live long and prosper that was from his temple in Boston. He's Jewish, and uh -huh. and his father told him, "Don't look up when they're doing this particular." Uh, ceremony, or I, I can't, I'm not explaining it the way it should be. And so he's a little kid, he looks up <laughs> and uh, he sees the uh, rabbi or someone doing this with um, fingers during the thing, and that's where he got that for. Um, oh, wow, that's yeah. wild! So, if for listener, if you don't remember the Spock, hand, live long and prosper, live long, it's um. If you, it's like you're, you got your hand up to like say stop, but then you spread your fingers, your, your two, to your pinky and your ring finger go one way and your, <laughs> your pointer and your middle finger go the other way. So you make like a V shape with your hand. Wow. That's wild. Okay. What's next? Number three. Okay. Next. Okay. Last one. Uh, I'm going to get this one. All right. So when he did Star Trek, there was a, you know, a lot of really different writers all the writers, and he had very strong opinions about each. When someone would write something about Spock, he what was cool about Gene Roddenberry and all the people that were involved with Star Trek, all the people on set, 
it sounded like, you know, people would bump heads and stuff, but, but overall you could contribute, at least he could and Shatner did and maybe some of the other actors did. I'm not sure. But for him, he would come to the, because he's the only actor who was in every single Star Trek. Oh, wow. Uh, the first Star Trek had a different person for oh, a captain, okay. different actor. But he would come to the writers and he would say, hey, can you change this? So he's very vocal about also season three because uh, there were some episodes that he just said, these are not good. Gene Roddenberry had actually left at that point. And so he couldn't, he would try to get Lean Gene to help out. But anyway, remember Harlan Ellison, who you mentioned, who would do the eye thing? Like uh, uh, Columbo would play pool with him? Oh, right. They played pool together and Columbo would pop his eye out and roll it around on the pool table. Yeah, so one of, the, one of uh, Spock's episodes, least favorite episodes, he wrote. Oh, this is the question? This is the question. Is this true or false? Least favorite. I'm going to say that's false. I'm going to say it was one of his most favorite. Yes, you're right. Yay! One of his most favorite. <laughs> good, good, Liz. I can't All trick right, you. two out of three. No, hard. you got me. You got me. You got one. Yeah, that, that one's called, um, it's called, let's see, let's type in Harlan Ellison. And I watched it, and it's really good. Um, very interesting. Wait, where do you watch old Star Treks? Uh, a Paramount Plus. Or okay. you could buy them on uh, Prime. Okay. Uh, Prime. Very cool. And probably something else, too. So for Star Trek, I don't know how many he wrote. What's the name of that one? The City on the Edge of Forever. Oh. Okay. 1967. I think that's season one. That was cool. Yeah, so that's one of his favorite. And he feels like... It can stand the test of time, and I agree. I think there's it's Joan Collins is in that one. Oh, cool! And when I saw the episode with uh, the lady in the other Columbo, where she plays Spock's wife or bride to be, the one the lady in the Columbo that we really liked from the Glass House really Jungle, nice. she's reading the book. Oh right! Oh right! Yeah 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 yeah! Yeah, that's another one of his favorites too. That's called A Muck Time, and that's when he actually uh, has a lot of anger in that episode as oh. Spock. I didn't know yeah. Spock was allowed to have anger. Well, the Vulcan tries to keep that in check always, um, but he was half human, half Vulcan. Oh, okay, okay. As Spock was. So, yeah, Liz, I had another one, but um, we didn't talk about the stuff, so I'll save it for another time. Okay. That sounds good. Good. Two out of three, right? Two out of three, yeah. Save your other one for next time. Yeah. Okay, and we got to give a quick shout out to our Uncle Mark, who passed away, who was a huge Star Trek fan. Oh, yeah. He went to the conventions and would dress up in Spock's blue yes. outfit, right? As Spock or? Well, not as Spock, but the blue. He wore the blue outfit. Yeah, yeah. He had Down syndrome. And uh, yeah, he was just, he would, he would love to be hearing us talk about Spock. That's for sure. And Sean, our brother, oldest brother, Sean. He was? He was a big Star Trek buff. I don't know how I don't know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He had uh, the Enterprise model. Oh, wow. um, I mean, you know, his tastes changed, but I, I do remember at one time okay. he really liked Star Trek because we would watch it on Fridays. I remember watching Star Trek um, on occasion for sure. Not regularly, but like yeah. definitely. Yeah. I think a pizza, and when we were, so you were just a baby, but in Vogel way, before we lived in Ramstein, I remember watching. Star Trek on a Friday night and with like a TV dinner with um, pizza, like frozen <laughs> pizza, maybe. Yum. I, I don't remember doing that a lot, but I do remember like one particular night we did that. <laughs> so maybe I'm getting it all confused, but I do remember that. And it was, was, was Vogel way because oh, I remember cool. that apartment. So you were born in 77. Yeah. But that was what city was that? Uh, Ramstein. You were born in Ramstein? Yep, at Launchstuhl okay. Air Force Base. Launchstuhl, okay, Air yeah. Force, okay. Mm -hmm. But we lived in Ramstein, which is, I think the Air Force Base is in there, or like next to there or something. I don't know. All right, Paul, let's All wrap right. this up. Thank you to Maxime Gervais for our theme song, Columbo. And this podcast is edited by John Warenas. Thank you, John. Good job, man. If you'd like to add to our conversation, email us at trenchcoatcigar at gmail.com or find us on Instagram at trenchcoatcigar, or you could do both. 
And if you could give our podcast a rating and a review wherever you're listening, that really helps our show find more Colombo fans who want to talk about Colombo. And Paul, one more thing. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Chaque détail, l'inspecteur Colomb.